Thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, very excited to be here at uh, All Things Open. Um, and today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, Kubernetes cluster upgrades and uh, an approach to doing these cluster upgrades using uh, blue and green clusters. A little bit about myself. I work as, as an SRE manager at Rakuten and we run Kubernetes clusters in production and we have several environments and I'm also a co-chair for the CNCF SIG runtime and I've been a contributor to the Kata Containers project for about the last two years. Yeah, so some of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, first, I'll briefly touch on the main Kubernetes components. You have the control plane and the data plane. Then I'll talk about some upgrade problems that you may run into uh, for Kubernetes clusters. Then I'll talk about some open source solutions and tools. Then I'll talk about what it may look like in when you have everything together in production. Then I'll touch on what it may look like in, in the future for some of these tools and, and, and when you do Kubernetes upgrades. And finally, I'll provide you some takeaways. So yeah, so the Kubernetes control plane. So typically uh, you either have a three node or, or five node or nine node uh, uh, control plane set up with uh, uh, either number of main nodes. I changed the terminology here uh, from master to main because um, they're changing that terminology in a lot of places. But in essence, you have in every node a uh, unique component of all these different parts of Kubernetes, like the API server, the Kube controller manager, the cloud controller, and the scheduler. And when you have either the three, five, or nine uh, control plane setup, you actually have a leader that's, that makes the decisions. And that's for each one of these components too. So when you have a specific Kubernetes version, uh, you have that specific uh, Kubernetes version for each one of these components too. So the controller manager, the API server, cloud controller, <coughs> all of them uh, have, in this example have the 118 version. And so they're all matching. That's a recommended practice. Some people don't run it this way, but then generally that's a recommended practice. Similarly, with the data plane, you have uh, your Kubernetes nodes where you run your workloads. And the most typical components there are the kubelet and the kube proxy. So for those, if you have Kubernetes 118, you also have that same version for those specific components. Right? So both of them match. And that's the, 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 the control plane and the data plane. But what are some of the upgrade problems that you may run into for, for these components? So in this tweet from last year, Stefan uh, said that he upgraded from Kubernetes 113 uh, and then, or to Kubernetes 113 and using GKE. And he did this feature call in place upgrade in the cloud provider and he had Istio running, and then Istio went from 1.0 to 1.1. And then a lot of the pods started crashing, so it's having, having problems. So basically, he had to restart all the different components uh, one by one in, in a specific order, and it got fixed, right? So, but then that's when it, what happened when he did the, the, the cluster upgrade, the in place upgrade. So one of the problems in Kubernetes uh, API or API, the API version or versions is that they keep changing them. So uh, initially when an object in Kubernetes gets released, it gets released under an API group. And typically that API group is defined as an API group, uh, alpha, alpha one, two, three, and four, so forth. And then it goes into beta when it's a little bit more stable. And then finally, when it becomes GA, 
it, it gets released into a stable API group and, and that's usually like a V1 or, or V2. So they keep constantly changing between different versions or Kubernetes versions. So this is how it goes. So typically you have a, a V1 alpha one and then there are some iterations behind that Kubernetes API group and object. And then uh, it goes to V1 alpha two, three, four, and then into beta one and then beta one, two, three. And then it goes to V1 and then it starts the cycle again when it's something new like V2 alpha one and then V2 beta one and, and then V2 and so forth. So here, another example where uh, uh, you see changes in a Kubernetes uh, API uh, with different releases, right? It, uh, so here with uh, RBAC in Kubernetes 120, you see that it's actually uh, removing the support for V1 alpha one and V1 beta one. So if you have any RBAC definitions uh, using V1 beta one or maybe some roles, some cluster roles, and then if you don't change them before 120, they will no longer be there. So you may run into problems there. So, so you, you, you may not have access to your cluster. So some things are not gonna work. And then another example is like plugins. So Kubernetes uses a lot of different plugins. In this case, it's AWS EBS. And then on the release notes, it says that it's gonna be removed in 121 in favor of this new feature for uh, CSI or CSI support for AWS. So that means if you have a, a volume, an EV elastic block storage volume where you have your data and you upgrade your cluster to 121, then you're using this and, and, and uh, maybe your volume will not be available. Your, your data is not gonna be available. So, uh, so these are some of the problems, right? So in this example, we have the RBAC role in V1 beta one in 117. And if, if you upgrade it to your cluster to 120, and then you keep that same definition for V1 beta one, uh, uh, you'll see that it's not necessarily going to work or it's not gonna, going to work and uh, your, your pods may not be available and here you're accessing your pods and your logs or maybe your logs uh, will not be accessible. Now, if you do this ahead of time, uh, maybe in a in place upgrade, uh, you have that B beta one on 117, but then before you do the 120 upgrade, you change that API definition to V1. So in this case, everything works and you're happy. It's because you did it ahead of time, right? So, um, but you need to plan ahead of time. And, 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 some, and, and this is just an example of with roles. So, so there may be many other examples where uh, you might have to care about all these changes with Kubernetes. And one of the things with Kubernetes is that there, it's a very fast moving project and there are a lot of new features being released. So there are other problems with uh, Kubernetes uh, versions for the different components. They do support versions queues, although the recommended practice is uh, to have all these uh, different components with the same version. Some people don't, right? So uh, if, you, if you don't, then you need to be really careful about you know, what supports what. For example, here, if you have a Kube API server 117, and if you have a Kube like 116 and 117, it will work fine. But if you have something like a cube like 115 or 114, that means your Kubernetes nodes, that, uh, it means that the, the, you're gonna have some incompatibilities and then basically your clusters may not actually run. So what are some of the solutions that uh, you can use and that are available uh, for these types of problems? So initially what I, share was a GKE cluster uh, upgrade that was an in-place upgrade. So in this case, you have all your control plane here with 118. Uh, in this example, you have three nodes. And then what it does is uh, actually, when you click that button, the main nodes 
uh, that are not the leader typically get upgraded first because they're not making any decisions, right? So uh, they're, they're easy to you know shut down and then bring up with a new version. And now when you upgrade that leader, there's gonna be uh, some downtime there because the API server, all these components need to restart. So what happens is because uh, Kubernetes has a consensus algorithm on all these different components and Kubernetes have consensus algorithms, they choose a new leader, right? So that leader is not there anymore. So it might be the, the one on the right, right here. So you have a brand new leader. So what happens is that when this, uh, the new leader gets elected and like I mentioned before, so these, some of these APIs are not supported, you may run into this, right? So you may run into crash loop backoffs. Uh, some of your pods are not gonna restart. Maybe you won't be able to access some of your R RBAC resources or, or, your, or your resources managed by RBAC. So a lot of uh, unpredictable results. Now, another approach is just to have these blue and green clusters. Uh, so you may want to just have more than just one production cluster. Uh, so in this case, you can have production clusters with different versions when you do that upgrade. So what does that look like? So in this example, you have a blue cluster with 118, 118 and all the different components, API server, server, a cube controller manager, a cloud controller. And then you have a brand new cluster uh, with uh, 119. Again, all these different components with the 119 version. So here you have the clusters side by side. Um, they're separate. Your workloads are separate. Uh, what you do um, is typically uh, you just create the, the same workloads on, in this example, 118, you create those same workloads on 119. So you have them ready there uh, for something to be switched over, right? So, uh, and then also that gives you opportunity to test what's in 119, make sure that your pods are not crashing, uh, make sure that your traffic is flowing seamlessly, make sure you, you're running those QA automation tests so you have that ahead of time. And then when, once you do all the verification and make, you make sure everything is running the way you want to, you can just simply uh, get rid of the old cluster um, after you do whatever switchover you need to do, either a traffic switchover or data or data uh, migration, depending on what you're trying to do. In the same way, if you have the data plane, you have all these Kubernetes nodes in 118, and also you create all these brand new nodes in 119 that are talking to that 119 control plane. And then the same way you start the, the, the workloads on those nodes on 119, exactly as 118. And then once you're done, you're switching over that traffic, you, you can just get rid of those 118 nodes. This is all possible because there's a lot of elasticity on all these cloud providers, you know, where you can just bring up a lot of infrastructure, you can tear it down and have all this automation. So other ways or other tools that you can use for uh, blue and green cluster deployments. Uh, you can use um, a feature from the Kubernetes community called Federation that allows you to have Kubernetes clusters in multiple regions. Right now it's in alpha. Uh, so you can use it in a way that, you know, you have clusters, maybe in the same data center, but, uh, but you have them side by side. Um, and then uh, Linkerd also provide, has this new uh, feature called cluster mirroring that allows you to um, think uh, or allows Kubernetes or a Kubernetes cluster to think that it has a service. Um, sorry about that. for this. Okay, so that, so you can use this um, um, way that Kubernetes to think uh, that the service is local 
but um, in reality, that service is in some other cluster, right? So this a cluster mirroring allows you to do that. Then you have a cluster API, which is a open source project um, uh, from the Kubernetes community too. And it's using Kubernetes itself to manage all these different clusters. And so you can have your fleet of clusters, you can create your blue, green, blue cluster and then your green cluster and manage this through something like cluster API. Now let's talk about some tools, uh, open source tools that you can use for these Kubernetes cluster upgrades. So whenever it comes to automation, uh, you can use any language. So you can use Bash, Python, Go, whatever. But typically you wanna orchestrate what's in your uh, Kubernetes cluster add-ons, right? So there are many things besides just the control plane that, and the data plane that you need to run in a cluster. So you have your um, mechanism for authenticating, your, you have your Nginx ingress controller, you have your monitoring tools, you have your uh, log aggregator, uh, your cluster autoscaler for automatically scaling Kubernetes nodes, all those different components, you can actually automate these with just simple uh, programming, right? So you have like, like any language of your choice. So that's typically the case that you, for, for you to um, automate some of these components. There are other tools though. So uh, you have the uh, Terraform that um, helps you create um, clusters across multiple cloud providers, or maybe your own cloud provider and maybe even this managed uh, offerings from the cloud providers like AWS EKS. Uh, also, there's another tool from Whip, Whipworks called EKS CTL, specifically meant for e, uh, EKS, but you can use it to define your clusters in a, a easy to read YAML format. Easy to read, some people think is easy, so, but it depends on, on, on your preference. Another tool is Flux. And this is from Weaveworks, and it also allows you to manage these uh, add-ons using uh, a way to uh, have some sort of like a GitOps approach to manage these add-ons. So you could have uh, these components that I talked about before, like Core DNS or cluster, the Cluster Autoscaler, Kubevert uh, for running VMs with Kubernetes. So all these different components you can manage with something like Flux, where um, they're running with container uh, images or uh, container versions of images. And you can make it so that it watches the versions of these container images and that it automatically upgrades these components when a new container version gets released. So you can have that full automation. So here you can you see that typically with uh, a Flux workflow, you have this GitOps approach where used for developers but you don't necessarily need to do this pushing. Uh, you can have it maybe watch some uh, container registry that actually um, publishes a new version of one of the Kubernetes components. Another tool uh, from Weaveworks, it's kind of early, but it's in the works. And it basically it allows you to do just plain GitOps for Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so you can keep that state of that Kubernetes cluster in a YAML file. And, and currently it doesn't support a lot of different um, projects or, or different uh, Kubernetes distributions or Kubernetes uh, cloud uh, offerings. So there's no support for AWS. There is support for GC, uh, Google, um, Google Compute Engine uh, and, and support for other things like Firecube uh, that allows you to run Firecracker VMs uh, in Kubernetes and Vagrant that allows you to run these uh, VMs um, locally. Uh, but you know it's it's still in the works, but it's something uh, that you can keep a lookout uh, for if you want to maybe manage your clusters in, in, a, in, in a YAML format, GitOps YAML type of way, uh, just like something like uh, Flux does for applications. Another tool is Keiko, and this tool is for uh, also managing your Kubernetes nodes. Uh, it only supports AWS. Um, the only um, 
yeah, the only thing is that they, they're very specific to AWS, but um, and it's because it's, it's from Intuit and they're heavily using AWS, but it has some nice features that allows you to do uh, forensic dumps for security. It helps you manage the cost of your cluster. Uh, it, it helps you uh, see the compliance of, of your cluster with no failures. So it's a good tool, especially if you're running in uh, AWS infrastructure. So the, uh, this is Keiko at a glance. Uh, so you have all these different components. You have your instance manager to, to ma manage all your nodes, um, a way to manage your costs with the minimum manager, a way to see the reliability of your nodes with the governor. Uh, you can do forensics with forensics and security, and you can monitor constantly what the behavior is for, for these clusters. So other tools for deploying clusters and they help you do this blue and green approach. Uh, so they they're very popular tools in the community like uh, COPS. It's basically deploying Kubernetes clusters uh, uh, in different cloud providers. It's written in Golang, so it supports Google Cloud. It supports uh, AWS. I believe it also supports uh, Azure. So. It's a very good tool to manage uh, clusters across multiple clouds, and you can create multiple uh, green, blue and green clusters when you want to do the, the cluster upgrade. Cube Spread is another similar tool. The only difference, or the only main difference between that and COPS, is that it's written in, in, in Ansible. So if you prefer something in Ansible, you can use something like Cube Spray. And then Linkerd, I mentioned this before briefly, but then it allows you to uh, switch over. Uh, the traffic more seamlessly by making Kubernetes think the, the service sits on the local cluster, but in, in reality, it sits on, on a remote cluster. Another interesting tool is Pluto. Uh, and this tool uh, allows you to uh, see all the different uh, or the main Kubernetes components with their API uh, groups and versions and when they're gonna be deprecated and meaning what Kubernetes version, main Kubernetes version, they're gonna be deprecated in and when they're gonna be removed. So for example, here you have deployment uh, extensions B1 beta one uh, deprecated in 1.9.0 and then completely removed in 1.16. And the replace, replacement for that is apps V1. Meaning if you have a deployment uh, with the definition uh, of extensions B1, beta one, and then you're running 115. And then the moment that you upgrade to 116, uh, that definition is not there anymore. Which means that when the deployment wants to start or wants, wants to change uh, something or wants to restart its spot, then it won't be able to do it, right? Because uh, it's not gonna be supported. So this tool actually allows you to see this ahead of time. And, and I touched on this in the beginning of the talk, but here you can see all of these different main comp Kubernetes components like stateful sets, ingress controllers, daemon set, et cetera. So I have a question here, but I'll, I'll get to it at the end of the talk. So uh, what does it look like in, in production or when you have all these different components in production? So yeah, so you want to have most of the components automated. It's, this is the ideal world. I think a lot of the people don't, uh, unless you're a main cloud provider, uh, but uh, you wanna get to that point. So you wanna fully um, automate that control plane, the data plane, so bring up the whole new uh, set of Kubernetes main, uh, main nodes and Kubernetes uh, worker nodes. Uh, also the add-ons, uh, cluster autoscaler, uh, core DNS, everything in full automation. And then maybe you want to uh, have manage your stateless applications in an automated way. So you have your CI CD system that deploys <clears throat> the full application uh, on the brand new clusters. So you, uh, you, just like you do blue and, green deployment, blue and green deployments of your applications, you can do uh, a blue deployment of your application on the blue cluster and it can do a green deployment of that specific application on the green cluster. And then you can do the switchover afterwards when 
after you do all the ver verification, you've run all your QA tasks also in a fully automated way. So ideally you wanna have everything automated, especially in production, you know, if you're handling uh, lots and lots of Kubernetes clusters. So what about stateful applications? Uh, so these are uh, a little bit more tricky or trickier uh, to handle because uh, you, you're actually uh, dealing with the data. So typically, typically you want to schedule um, a maintenance window uh, and so make sure everything is okay. But I think one important aspect is that you also need, want to back up all your data. That's where maybe you're keeping the, cost, the, the, the data for your customers, right? So um, maybe you are a, a major website like we are, then we have to keep uh, the data there uh, secure. And then when we do the migration, we have to um, um, uh, make sure we don't lose it. So it's, it's, you know, back up that data constantly. Uh, so if you're using a cloud provider or uh, an, an advanced storage uh, mechanism, you can make use of these snapshots for volumes. <clears throat> and, and instead of just like um, uh, moving the data, doing raw copy of your data, you can just snapshot these volumes and then create a, a whole instance of that new volume somewhere else and start with the, with the new uh, Kubernetes cluster. Then create multiple replicas if you're using something like uh, MySQL. So MySQL allows you to have multiple read replicas. Uh, and uh, when you do that cluster switchover, maybe you can create a, a, a read replica. And then when at the moment of doing that switchover, you change that master from the old cluster to the new cluster. And if you have multiple masters, which is not that typical, you can also do this by by um, moving these one by one uh, for e for um, for each cluster. So it's, so if, for the old cluster and the new cluster. So this is very critical because of your data, and it's it's, it's a lot uh, more tricky than than just uh, the the regular state stateless applications. So what does it look like uh, for the uh, these these tools, the, these Kubernetes uh, cluster upgrades in the future? So we'll see more more of these tools to fill some of the gaps, <coughs> in open source tools, and even some vendors uh, that help you do that automatic uh, traffic switchover. So say you're handling uh, millions of millions of requests or, or billions of requests, and then you want to do that switchover maybe at the DNS provider when you when you do that cluster upgrade. So maybe we'll have these tools that automatically change that, that DNS entry or um, talk to that API uh, service, like uh, for example, Route 53, 53 in, in AWS and change that, that, that to, the, to the new endpoint that, has the, that is running in the new cluster. And maybe we'll see more tools that help you have that data consistency across multiple stateful uh, applications or, or within the same stateful application. But when you're migrating that Kubernetes uh, cluster and, and moving that application to that new Kubernetes cluster. So make, make sure that you have the backup uh, of your data, make sure that, that you, it does the master switch over if you're using something like a MySQL. So we'll see more of that. Uh, so we'll see more, more, more tools maybe that help you monitor when these upgrades uh, happen for the add-ons. Uh, so, so did we actually upgrade the cluster autoscaler? Does it have the right version? Is it not crashing because uh, it's, it's talking to an older API uh, version? So all these different things that, that in terms of monitoring. The another important aspect here is security. So um, there are a lot of uh, vulnerabilities or CVEs that actually get published for say Kubernetes. So, so you wanna check these uh, before you do your upgrade and after you upgrade. Uh, you also wanna check your container images uh, that are not having any uh, code that could be uh, maybe exposed to vulnerabilities. Uh, so if you're using a runtime or a programming language, that has some vulnerabilities. Uh, you can use image scanners, for example, but we'll see more of these tools that help you integrate a, a lot of these uh, security mechanisms. 
so another aspect maybe where we'll see more uh, innovation and changes is the service meshing uh, in multi-cluster. We talked about federation, but what about uh, having a microservice in, in different, uh, spread across different clusters and having this seamlessly switch over between the different clusters and, and do the rebalancing if you don't want to have uh, all these services uh, um, uh, you know, in, in just a single cluster or you, or you want to get rid of them in, in, the, in, in the old cluster. And then maybe operator, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, operators in the ecosystem now, Kubernetes operators, and then some of these may be aware of, of when you do the cluster upgrade. Right now, I believe most of them are just focused on just managing maybe like a stateful application within Kubernetes, like a, like a like an Apache Kafka or like um, like a database, like a, a Cassandra cluster or something like stateful. But then maybe some of these will become more aware of cluster upgrades. We'll see more innovations with the, in the cloud providers too. So we'll see, for example, in EKS, they're talking more about uh, doing that full cl one click cluster upgrade with all the different verifications that, it, that need to happen. Uh, notifications uh, when there's a patch. So, and, and uh, also more ways to manage these Kubernetes nodes. Uh, so make sure that you actually patch up your operating system and your Kubernetes node or patch up the, the Kubernetes minor version, right? So the Kubelet has this minor version that gets released uh, very often. So you may want to, the cloud providers will facilitate that on, at the Kubernetes node level or Kubernetes worker. So what can you get out of all of this? Um, so when you're doing the, uh, the cluster upgrades, uh, always kind of start small, begin with a, like a small set of your applications, start with a small cluster. And, uh, and you always want to test ahead of time. Uh, so you always want to have a QA type of environment, never actually you know, do this upgrades in production, especially if you're doing in-place upgrades. Um, you also want to let, continue leveraging all these open source tools. Uh, lots of them, I mentioned a lot of them. There actually, there are quite a few other tools that you can use that I didn't mention. Uh, in this example, you know, Terraform with Keiko to manage your Kubernetes node and Terraform to manage your, your Kubernetes uh, creation, cluster creation. Or you can use something like Flux or Terraform. Then, uh, when you create that, that green cluster, we, uh, we talked about the standard practice of having the same Kubernetes version for all the different components. So make sure you never mix these versions because that actually complicates things. You always want to keep your Kube API server, your Kube controller manager, your Kubelet, all these different components in, in the Kubernetes uh, or the, that, that are part of the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster, the same version. You can use also this tool called kubectl convert that it helps you convert uh, the API manifest or the, the Kubernetes manifest from one version to another. So you can migrate the, uh, your old definitions to your new definitions. And hopefully when you create that green new cluster, you don't have any, any problems with, with talking to the API server, the Kube API server. You always want to test, test, run your QA automation ahead of time before you do that switch over, and always back up your data, especially if you're running stateful applications. Uh, I mentioned that this is very important because this is where you have your customer data, and this is where uh, maybe the, if you're running a business, you uh, maybe one of the most critical components. Yeah, with that, I, I have some references here to some of the, the projects that I mentioned. And yeah, and thank you. I think that's that's all I have for now. Um, I love to talk about this topic. And you know, I'm, we're constantly using Kubernetes and uh, doing upgrades. So if you have any problems with, with them and if I'd uh, love to, to chat about what solutions you, you actually uh, found and, and, and what challenges you've actually come across uh, and that, that may need solutions. So thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions. So I think I have, 
a question here. So, um, are there any work any any workloads not suited for blue green deployment? Thinking maybe clusters with large stateful apps. Yeah. So the, the I, I think this question came before I mentioned. I, okay. So he mentioned that I covered it pretty well. Yeah. Stateful applications. Yeah. They're more of a challenge. Uh, it can still be done, uh, but then you you have to be maybe schedule some uh, downtime uh, or maintenance window. And, and you have to make use of all these different tools for the different uh, stateful type of uh, application that you're running. Uh, so for say like MySQL or Postgres, you have to create multiple replicas. Uh, if you are storing on disk, maybe use something like a volume, like an elastic volume, and then use, make use of snapshots with something like a Cassandra database. Maybe you want to have a, a, a expand the cluster and have a tool to rebalance your cluster. Of course, if you have a lot of data, this becomes really challenging because uh, to rebalance your cluster, it may take a lot of time. But then, yeah, you have to keep thinking about these, and and there are some other things that you have you can think about, maybe like sharding your data so that, that there is not relying on a single cluster. So you do a bit by bit. So those are some of the architectural decisions that you have to weigh. But it's it's a lot more challenging. Okay, so okay, I don't think I have any more questions. Okay. Okay, there's another question. Would you be hesitant to do blue green if you don't own the data? Another team is using a cluster you manage. Yeah, I mean that that I, I will be a little bit more concerned about that if I don't have all the the automation in place. But um, you also have to uh, watch what your service level agreements are. And maybe if you are internally within an organization, if you have some sort of SLOs or service level objectives, uh, and then you, you can see what is risky or less risky to do, right? Depending on what you have there. Uh, and, and, and depending on what kinds of tasks you, you've actually, you have actually run prior to doing this uh, upgrades. So it is, it, 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 when you always, when you talk about stateful applications, it's always uh, uh, risky. There's always more risky risk in there. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Or, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, any other questions? I think that we have one question from Ramesh here. Um, it looks like he has his hand rose. Um, I will allow him to talk here and see if he uh, can ask this question. Okay, I think I have it on the chat. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I have a question regarding, so if you maintain uh, two different clusters like uh, green and blue, so keeping the uh, project cost in mind, so that may increase the total cost of the project, correct? So yeah. how to solve that problem in that case? So it, it will increase the cost of your project regardless, uh, but you can mitigate it by, by using some of these uh, cloud providers. I mean, if you run your own infrastructure, it becomes more challenging, but if you have your own infrastructure, maybe you already have the money to pay for that. Uh, so that, that may not be too much of a challenge there, but like, like if you are maybe a place that that is, you know, constrained economically, you you could um, you know just take advantage of some of the cloud providers and their elasticity, right? Where you um, you basically uh, just bring up the brand new node or the brand new Kubernetes cluster, and and maybe it doesn't have to be very. If you have a lot of workloads on the old cluster. And then you bring up the new node. Don't bring up that. Or bring bring up the new cluster. Don't bring up that new cluster uh, with um, with all the Kubernetes nodes. Uh, just bring them up gradually as you move the workloads, and then you can continue to shut down the old ones actually gradually, so that you kind of minimize your 
the, the, the cost, right? So you're always gonna have a little bit more cost. Uh, and there are some other things that you can use to, uh, to, use to optimize cost. For example, um, the um, use of something like spot instances or pre-interval instances. Uh, so if you, if you don't have workloads that are very critical, I know we talked about stateful type of workloads, but, so those may not be the best um, use case. But if you have uh, so stateless applications, maybe they're okay if you're running those in, in preemptible nodes or, or spot nodes. Uh, and, and there are a lot of other tools, for example, like a, uh, AWS, I know has some uh, uh, way to, to run spot fleets and in, in, in a certain uh, number of different spot instances where you can say, uh, give me like 10 different uh, instance types that I can run. So that means like if one of them uh, actually becomes super expensive, uh, you will still have capacity enough there to run your instances. So you, you could actually, uh, you know, uh, optimize your cost. But um, the bottom line is that you're always going to pay just a, a little bit more. And I think it, it, it is more reliable because you, you're, you, you're actually having a whole new uh, cluster with your new workloads and it gives you time to test ahead of time. But again, if you want a little bit more reliability, there's gonna be a little bit more cost. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Oh, there was another one here. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, thank you very much, Ricardo, for the talk. That was great. Um, thank you for everyone that attended for attending this talk. And this is the last one for the cloud track of the day. Um, you are um, encouraged. Oh, there's uh, one more sorry, Ben. I see. I see that you got a question coming through. So uh, we'll answer Ben's question quick. Um, go ahead and type it or request to talk. Okay. Oh, there it is at the top of the Q and A. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, a question for auto scaling AWS. I've had a hard time helping node scaling quicker, more sensitive, uh, based on the parameters like scan interval, scale down, unneeded, scale down utilization. Do you have a good reference for me to understand how these parameters uh, work? Uh, scan interval, scale down, unneeded, scale down utilization. Um, oh, this is for AWS, yeah. So, yeah, so I think it's, it, it's, it's these are kind of, uh, it's, yeah, this question is kind of broad. Uh, um, so you, I mean, the typical scenario is where <clears throat> uh, you have CPU or memory constraints, right? So where where you um, where you have like uh, maybe if you if you have the average of all your Kubernetes nodes at sixty percent, in AWS you may have like auto scaling group, but if, and then say you have it at sixty percent start adding new uh, Kubernetes node. And, and that's just a standard auto scaling in Kubernetes. And it could be also memory, right? So if you have memory utilization, let's say 70 or 80% across all your nodes, you start scaling up. Now, if that average it starts to go down, then it, it, it starts to uh, come down. But now like uh, it, it, it's easier for stateless type of workloads because those are, you know, you don't have any data there. And then the data can be the, picked up from like a, a database that is not running in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, uh, so he's so you're asking whether there's a good reference. So I think um, you know AWS has pretty good. I think he has pretty good documentation on auto scaling groups. But then also there are parts that you know, Kubernetes that are not part of an uh, auto scaling group, and that is the cluster auto scaler. Uh, so that's an open source project. <clears throat> so 
you may want to go to just Google uh, Cluster Autoscaler in, on GitHub, then, uh, then you'll find the, the page of Cluster Autoscaler with its documentation and how to use it. <clears throat> but the Cluster Autoscaler scales based on cluster capacity. So if a uh, pod cannot be scheduled anymore on a Kubernetes node, what it does is actually brings up a new uh, Kubernetes node uh, in, in the cloud provider in, in for say AWS. And so I, I don't know uh, if that answers part of the question, maybe it does a little bit, but I would be happy to chat uh, more. It, uh, if you have, uh, based on some of the, some resources might be helpful for you, then I'd be happy to, to provide some more. Um, And and then feel free to feel free to speak up to if you if you'd like to 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 discuss anything. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I'm available on Twitter, so uh, you can ping me on Twitter anytime. So if, if you have any questions, then I'm happy to chat. Oh, you can chat outside the channel. Yeah. Cool.